Now, I'm really excited to be speaking here today, so I'll try and pace myself because I know with public speaking I get a bit nervous. So uh, when we started discussing Dream Big at the beginning of the year, I said, look, everyone benefits from knowing how to pitch a story and reaching an audience, the best way to do it, I think, is through storytelling. It's one of those things that really sticks in people's minds. And so I'm going to give some pointers here about how to, how to craft a narrative and the successes and failures that I've, I've learned you know, through lessons along the way. My background has been working in communications for in a variety of areas, Western River in Arts most recently, also local government, environmental management, the local university, and I also work with what I guess is called a lifestyle website. I also have you know, a history as a musician. I have been making music, well, for the last decade, I've been releasing it online. It was my interest in music that sort of led me into communications. So I'm going to sort of overlap the two a bit here. Mm -hmm. It all started for me with BMA magazine in Canberra. It's street press and um, with an entertainment focus. And really that was the starting point of being published and I think, you know, um, writing about the arts. Uh, these days with Western Riverine Arts, this is our new look website, which I think Derek's done a fantastic job on. And, you know, the role of Western Riverina Arts, like regional arts boards, is about sort of uh, trumpeting the artists in the, in the um, region, but um, building, you know, artistic practice and audiences for arts in the region. And um, it's here that I think it's really key that we um, pass on skills about how to share your narrative as an artist and, and to get people interested in your work. Because in doing so, you're not just interesting people in your own work, you're interesting people in the arts in general. And so, you know, one example of the sort of story that I've written is um, about Peter Coppolo here. And in a lot of ways, it ticked the boxes for being quite the obvious story to get picked up by the paper. You know, Peter had won an award for his painting and it was on display with his artworks. Um, but I thought it was more interesting to sort of talk a bit about some of the terminology Peter used for his, his work. And, you know, he, he distinguished this work to his other work in that it was impressionistic and the others were expressionistic. And so those sorts of things, they might be difficult to try and explain in a newspaper article. I, I, I don't step back from sort of putting the terminology out there and hope that people will pick it up. I also think that it, it also ticks all the boxes because there is a perception in, in, the, in regional Australia that the arts are pretty paintings. And I think that there really is an impetus for everybody to get out there and show that the arts are a much broader style of practices and to, to make people recognise the benefit of, of being involved, not just as an audience member, but, you know, in adopting art practice in their own life. I often think about it in terms of exercise. You know, everybody knows exercise is good for you and they kind of look at professional athletes and they say, well, you know, I'm never going to be a professional athlete. Why, why would I want to get off the couch? But to my mind, the arts are the same, you know, whether or not you, you aspire to put together a show in a gallery or um, broadcast your work on, on live online, those steps in terms of following through a practice and the lessons you learn, they apply elsewhere. And I, that was my point in terms of saying that, you know, music was what led me to, to writing about the arts. And, and I, you know, I think everybody sort of benefits from looking around at what other skills are related in the field. And now I am talking about public relations. And I think there has never been a better time in terms of getting your story out there. Crikey in 2010 had this survey about the amount of content that is public relations material in the newspapers. And, you know, over half of it comes from, from media releases. And, you know, as costs are getting cut, um, journalists don't have the time uh, or there aren't the journalists to, to get out there and do the research about stories. So I think, you know, everybody's got to be aware that if they want to get a story out there, then here here is the opportunity to do it because the media are really uh, content hungry and, you know, they're always looking for the material and, you know, they, they often appreciate people coming forward and saying, you know, here's something I've got going on. But I do think you need to give them a bit more than here's something I've got going on, which is a point I'm going to get to. But I just was reminded also that these stats in Crikey the other day about the cutbacks in, in, um, in staff at, at the media organisations uh, becoming more and more pronounced. And I, I think that just shows what opportunities are out there for people to have their content reach a wider audience. And actually, an example that I saw in the Daily Advertiser the other week that kind of shows the, um, the scarcity of storytelling, I think, in the media is the way that they're now adopting the methods used by sites like you know BuzzFeed and putting together listicles, which sounds a little bit like testicle to me. And I think it lacks balls. But the idea that you can group a bunch of things together thematically, and that is a story, there's something missing. Where is the story? It's just a, a bunch of numbers. It's a bunch of things that share something in common. So what is storytelling? 
And look, here is the master, Stephen King, at work decades ago by the look of it. Love that computer. <laughs> Yeah, there's a story about Stephen King um, saying that he, he has a, a, a jar with the heart of a child in it. And he uses it in a different context to the way I've always thought of it, like, which was to say, I'm not a strange person, I've just got a child's heart in a jar. But I, I like to think that when Stephen's writing his books, he looks in his top drawer and he looks at the little jar and he sees whether or not the heart's beating and how fast it's beating, and he gets an idea about whether or not he's onto a good thing. I think, you know, one thing is, is it illustrates Stephen King because he does that with a lot of stories. He gives things magical properties, you know, like suddenly there's a car that kills people because it's possessed. And that aspect of giving, making things possessed with meaning, giving them, you know, a magical meaning, I think that magic in meaning is what storytelling is all about. If you were to ask a editor or a journalist what was in their top drawer, I suspect it would look like this. Because every time you're asking them to run a story, you're asking them to give a shit. And this was spelt out for me at a panel I was, I was watching earlier this year, and um, a guy from a you know, hip happening website was saying, when we get a story, the first thing we do is we check on our give a shitometer. And, and there is that element that if a story's got to have some traction, it's got to have some meaning. And so how do you add the meaning to the story? And I'll, I'll give a few clues. When you're looking for your story, there are many ways to go about pulling it together. But I, and often in this piece, I'm going to talk about writing media releases. Um, I, that's my, my, my skill is, is, is writing, and I think writing is one way that allows me to articulate things better than in front of people on microphones. But this story really spelt it out for me, the importance of writing a media release, because I, I spoke to this journalist on the phone. We had a fantastic conversation. Like, she listened to me for almost an hour, and then when the paper came out, I read it, and there were, like, errors all the way through it. And I'm, I'm not picking on the journalist, but I, it was, it was a, a conversation. And, you know, there's, that, there's a diagram that a guy called Stuart Hall put together about how you encode information, you communicate it, you broadcast it, and then it's decoded at the other end. Well, there was a lot of problems with the encoding and decoding in that, in that conversation, obviously. Like, she mentions that I was working with the Hanwood Centenary when it was Leeton. You know, there was, there was a number of errors in it, but... So what makes a story? There are the five W's, which are pretty key to you know, every media release. So OK, the who, what, when, where, why. These fall together in what's called the inverted pyramid for storytelling. And for me, it's quite telling that this pyramid has had the tip cut off it, because newspapers will cut things from the bottom up. And really, when you get down to it, the who, what, where, when can be summed up in a sentence. And so it is the why that sort of becomes the body of, of, a, of your storytelling. And one thing I was reminded of when I was, I was putting together this presentation, I came across this quote on the website Brain Pickings, and it was really sort of saying to me that aside from that you shouldn't use two semicolons in a sentence, that you can't expect the why to give people everything. You've got to allow a bit of space for them to be able to interpret the information. You know, your goal isn't to tell people what it is. Your goal is to get people through the door, to, to be interested in having a look. And so you've got to give, you know, enough that they can, they can get interested. Uh, this was a nice little sort of cartoon to illustrate that, in that, you know, this person isn't exactly explaining, you know, what it is that they're wondering about. You know, it's allowing people to join them in that sense of wonder. So... This, this is how you, you share your shit. Uh, one story that I, I put together uh, last year was about Emma Piltz, who's a, a Narendra-based artist, who'd put together these um, you know, beautiful displays of, of found objects in uh, windows over in Leeton. You know, it reminded me that when I was writing for BMA, I'd go and interview bands and I'd say, so guys, what sort of music do you make? And they were almost always guys, but there were a few girls. And they'd say, oh, we don't want to be pigeonholed. Well, you know, you're going to get pigeonholed. You know, people need either an idea of what they're getting into to come and have a look, or they're going to get there and they're going to make up their own mind. You know, you may as well get in there and claim a bit of that territory beforehand. Give them something to hang, hang on to in terms of creating meaning. And with Emma's work, I was really caught with the line of curated landscapes because she was working with found objects or she was representing the landscape in a way that made me think, you know, she's giving a very strong sort of perspective of the landscape. And so, you know, whenever somebody says, you know, what did you like about Emma's work? I say, oh, I love her curated landscapes because to me that really kind of caught something. And, you know, it's not the end meaning of it all, but it's just one example of how it was meaningful to me.
Another example that came to me was in, in 2011, I organised the screening of Metropolis in Leeton, uh, projecting it onto the water tower. And I was quite surprised when I wrote the media release and I compared Metropolis to the film Avatar, which, you know, is a few years old now. But And there were similarities in terms of the way the storyline worked. But I did start hearing people sort of come back with the idea that they hadn't thought of it as being like Avatar before. And, you know, those sort of comparisons can can really work. So how do you, how do you get together to working out what your narrative is and what your story is? Um, look, one of the best steps is talk about it with a friend. You know, as soon as you start talking about something, you're activating different parts of your brain and, you know, they give you feedback that you mightn't have anticipated or they see a parallel that you hadn't seen. This is like what we are talking about before about market research. You know, it, it doesn't hurt to, to, to get out there and get some other viewpoints on what it is you think you're trying to articulate. I think writing things down, once again, is another of those aspects that allows you to, to activate different parts of your brain. And I keep talking about brains and, you know, the left and the right side of the brain stuff is a bit overstated in pop psychology because they show that, you know, when you write, parts of the left and the right side of the brain are activated. When you talk, the same thing. But in doing those activities, there are a whole heap of neighbouring parts of the brain that get activated as well. And that's where you can really hit upon, like, some creative ideas. One thing that often I don't hear people talk about, particularly in the arts, is are there influences? And as I mentioned with bands, a lot of bands would be like, oh, we don't want to say we sound like X, when really, of course they sound like X. And people are going to say, you guys sound like X. There are reasons for that, I understand. I've got this book here called Steal Like an Artist. Um, personally, I find it rather distressing that, um, you know, art is supposed to be an academic pursuit, but in most other areas, the academy, you know, you give references, you give footnotes, you acknowledge where your ideas come from. And I think if your inspiration is good enough for you, it's probably going to trigger a lot of other things for other people too. I think there's a, there's a lot of things that can be opened up through sharing your influences and your inspiration and giving people that sort of groundwork, that context to understand what it is that you're doing. And, you know, I talk about the arts, but I think this equally applies elsewhere. And of course, influences are like the origin story. And so many hero stories have the origins. That's what explains what it is that the person is and what, why they do what they do. I mean, Spider-Man here is an example. The radioactive spider is pretty silly. And the movies have been acknowledging that in recent times because they keep changing that origin a little bit. But those origins are those things that give people an idea where you're coming from. And, you know, it doesn't hurt. The other thing with heroes' journeys is that there's a whole body of work out there about heroes' journeys. And, you know, Joseph Campbell is the guy who really hit upon it and looked at myths across different cultures and said, you know, there's things in common with these heroes in different parts of the world. And my point here is that when you look at your own, you know, narrative that you're on in a particular project is that there are a number of opportunities to share a story. It doesn't all have to be one big all-encompassing narrative about you went from A to Z. You know, there's stops along the way where you can say, and, and this happened. And they're, they're bite-sized, digestible kind of stories about, like, you know, what's happened in a project. And once again, it brings people along your journey. It, keeps, it engages an audience. And this, this was one project where, you know, uh, it developed as a result of that. And I, I did a workshop to, to share the contact microphone recordings I was making of playgrounds with some local kids. And um, it kind of illustrated the story, like I was saying, um, because that the previous piece was about promoting the fact that I was doing these screenings. And I was quite surprised when the paper followed me up the next week and said, how did they go? They wanted to do a story about how the screenings went, whereas I thought it was all wrapped and done and dusted. But there we go. There was another, another opportunity to tell a story about a project that I hadn't expected. And here's a project that we worked on late last year. We had an exhibition called Reimagining the Murrumbidgee, and there's some copies of the catalogue over here on the table. One thing with this, with this um, project was that it worked across our region of uh, Narendra, Leeton and Griffith, and the media release was rewritten for each of those regions to focus on the artists based in those regions. And uh, this was the irrigated story, and uh, Derek is based in Leeton, so he, he's the shiny, smiley face there. Another interesting thing I learnt in the process of promoting this uh, exhibition 
was I, I had met with a, a producer from Radio National last year and I, I pitched the exhibition to her. I said, you know, reimagining the Murrumbidgee, we've got five artists interpreting the river in different media, in different ways, raising ideas about the environmental, recreational and economic benefits of the region. And she kind of looked at me and she was, I could see this thought bubble, you know, this ticking over and she sort of said, oh yeah, I suppose if we did it for Talkback Radio, we could talk about, you know, what's your experience of the river, you know? How, what holidays have you had on the river? What are your memorable river stories? And it, I was like, how does that relate to the exhibition? You know, I, I can't see it at all. But it really, she was opening up that, that story to a wider audience than I could see a way to, to reach. And it was, like I said, it was something I hadn't considered at all about how to tap into other people's experiences in trying to, to share, you know, the experience of our exhibition. It was really um, quite illustrative for me. A more recent case study is um, Melanie Ifield, who's a, a Leeton-based author, who's in the audience here today. And um, Melanie came in in February and said, I've written these three books, I want to I want to tell people about them. And um, I was blown away that she'd published three books in 2013. I thought that was amazing because, you know, most people work on books for years and it, it turned out Melanie had. But it was her motivation for getting the books out when she did was um, enduring chronic fatigue had given her a focus on, on working on her book. So I saw this human interest story in, in it that I, I sort of worked into the media release and I thought, wow, this, is, this should be, you know, reaching a wider audience. I, I think, you know, it really shows the power of the arts to give, you know, people an activity. And, you know, there's that recipe for happiness that's ascribed to the Chinese that says you um, need someone to love, something to do and something to hope for. Well, you know, engaging with the arts allows a, at least a couple of those. I, th I thought it was a, a really good story and I, I was actually a bit dismayed when I sent it and a month went by before the local paper ran it. I thought, you know, here's a local story, local person, the local papers love local faces in local stories. And they sat on it for a month and I realised that it didn't have the timeliness aspect to it. It didn't, it didn't capture something that was happening now or in an immediate future. So they had the luxury of sitting on it for a certain amount of time. And, and um, I had at the time sent along this sidebar about the, the, um, the, uh, the money that the arts add to the, um, the economy that we've, we mentioned earlier. And I, th I think once again, it's, it's a really important message to be putting out about the arts, about the value that they add. And it, it, it encapsulates my own experience in that, you know, my own interest and enthusiasm in the arts led me to develop skills that have, have, have created the career. And most recently, it's like it's come a full circle because Melanie came in a, a couple of months ago and sort of said, I'm still hoping to reach a wider audience. And I said, well, you know, you had one book set in Canberra. I'm sure we could get, uh, you know, a media outlet in Canberra interested in the story. I've got some contacts to with BMA magazine. So, you know, we reshaped the media release to, to work for the, the Canberra audience because they weren't likely to have read The Irrigator and know the story already. And, and I kind of said, look, we need an angle that makes it relevant to Canberrans. And, and we worked on this, this opening line, which kind of really, I guess, flattered Canberrans that there is a secret life to Canberra that everybody misses outside of the, when they think it's just a place of, full of politicians. Finally, I just want to emphasize the value of a, of a good image. Like I've, I've got a lot of use out of this photo that I took uh, early 2012. It, it shows me, you know, tapping away on a playground with a set of headphones on. So there's a number of cues there that show, you know, what, what I'm doing and what my practice is with sound. But it also has a smiling face looking at a camera. And, you know, this, this is a key thing in, in preparing a photo for a media organization is that looking out at the, at the viewer. When I worked at Charles Sturt University, you know, we always put smiling faces on the front of books. And one day I sort of said, why do we always have the smiling faces on the front of the books? And they said, well, because they work. <laughs> yeah. when, when, you, when you see a smiling face, you know, it's, you, you're more interested in what the contents are than if somebody was looking the other way. And it's like that when you look at newspapers, they like to see people looking out the pages because that's what grabs a, a reader's attention. The other thing is that a good image draws attention to the article. And if you're gonna to go to the effort of putting together the words, don't sell yourself short by not including an image to, to help draw attention to the piece. So quickly to recap, write the story that you'd want to read. It doesn't matter whether or not you're going to send it out or not. Having that narrative is going to give you something to fall back on when you have to explain what it is you do. And, you know, there are so many, like I said, there's the perception that the, the region's arts are all about pretty pictures. And you can. I've read so many pieces where artists say, oh, I like colour and I like shapes. Well, no shit. <laughs> 
share, share inspiration, give insight. And, and I, I think that that is it. You want to educate your audience a little bit, not just about what to expect, but what you want them to, to, to gain out of it. And it doesn't have to be as, as obvious as telling them. It, it really should just, you know, leave a number of clues so that they can piece them together and, and reach their own conclusion. Look for opportunities. I mentioned the piece about the value of the arts and what they add to the economy. I, I think that, that was one example of a supporting piece. The other thing is like my own project working with Leeton Centenary. You know, I picked the biggest party in the town to, to, to you know, hitch my wagon to um, and have a good image. So um, please get out there and tell your story. Like I said, I think, you know, the, the value of the arts in the region really depends upon it. And um, you've got a lot to gain out of doing so. Thanks very much.